Hey everyone, welcome to an episode of the Florida Sound Archive podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Kaiser, and I have a special guest here with me, which by the way, this is the first time that this guest has ever done an interview like this before, so I'm very excited to have him on to tell his story. Let's welcome on Tommy Berman. Tommy, welcome on to the podcast. How are you? Great, dude. How's it going? It's going good. Great to have you on. For those that may not be familiar with your name, may not have, have heard of you before, quickly, you are the co-founder of the Dungeon Studios in Miami, Florida. Is that right? Yes, amongst other things. Amongst other things. And we're going to be getting into the story today. So if you're joining us, whether you're watching it on YouTube or whether you're listening on your favorite podcast, your podcast platform, Welcome in. It's going to be a great episode. So, Tommy, let's go ahead and start out with the early beginnings of your story. Where'd you grow up? I was born at North Miami General Hospital. So I'm a native. They say you got to be one to know one. So you grew up in Miami, Florida. Did you ever live outside of Miami or did you pretty much live in Miami your entire life? I was in Oakland, California for a couple of years uh, recently. Um, but other than that, South Florida, I mean, like, really, where else do you want to be? Yeah, that's true. So as you were growing up in South Florida, what are some of your earliest memories of getting exposed to music? So as a child, my mom was, um, I don't know, there's like pictures of like Jackie Gleason and other celebrities holding me. So I, I don't know what she was into, but um she needed a drummer for my sisters for their baton um, routines. So um, she had the drummer from the Fountain Blue um, teach me, start teaching me drums. So that's how I got my first drum kit. And that was my introduction to music. So um, I remember being in band class in school and like I got assigned the tuba. I'm like, I wanted no part of the tuba. It was like forced on me. But I got to learn a lot from the tuba that I wouldn't have learned on the jump kit. So I appreciate it now. You know? How'd you feel playing the tuba as it's like the largest instrument in the band? So how'd that feel? It kicked my ass. I mean, I I, I was never looking forward to like coming in to play the tuba. But as I look back at it now, I realized there was a lot of, I learned there, you know. That right. was the big theory for me and just a lot of other things that came together. You know, so I could you... the drummer's time, you know, so. Um, exactly. Where'd you go to high school? I went to North Miami Beach Senior High. Um, Island Oaks and JFK split shift for middle school. Um, so, yeah, I wasn't able to graduate due to some health things that happened to me. So I got a certificate of attendance and a GED. And I went to the Art Institute for, um, that was my college, Art Institute, yeah. When you were in high school, do you recall any friends of yours or people that you just knew who were in local bands at that time? Yeah, there was, uh, I, I want to say the Goldberg Brothers or Goldman Brothers. They used to play in front of the high school. Um, so I wasn't um, in a band that played out, but I had some friends that I would play with. I had a, I want to say Yamaha drum kit then. So we were playing, but we weren't playing out. My buddy Crazy and Mark Caffel. Uh, I don't even know that we had a name for the band. Um, but a little later on, um, this kid, Vinny Vaughn, and uh, I can't remember the guitar player's name, but we were jamming and there were some guys that used to come around and like, give us pointers and stuff. And um, Dom Dawkin actually was one of them, and Jaco Pastoris was the other. So we were getting some good tutelage, but you know, you're young. Um, some things just don't work out, you know? So. Right. <laughs> did, did you actually meet Jaco back then? Did you know well, him that, personally? That, Jaco was a, you know, a fixture down here, bro. Like, if you were in the scene, you knew Jaco, you know? He was a little... Um, there was something special about him, but there was something off too, you know? So he was a really good guy. I've had the pleasure of meeting his kids too. Um, so 
when you when you first learn of his passing the way he passed away you know what was that like for you i mean it was just a horrible situation all the way around because you know there was hope that he might live you know and then you got to feel for everybody you know because it's just um it's a disease that really took his life you know alcoholism so and the person that actually was blamed for his death i mean like he wasn't trying to kill him, you know? So, I mean, there was nothing but sadness. Um, yeah, it's still sad. Yeah, it is. It is see his picture on this a big old mural of the guy. They've got a park named after him. Right. And the weather report, baby. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Jack, he was the first real thing that came out of South Florida, as far as I'm concerned, you know? Did there that... Did that help introduce you at all to jazz? Or were you already into jazz music at that point? Well, like, I learned from a jazz drummer. So, like, I mean, it's the way you're holding the sticks, I mean, to me, is just indicative of who you are and where you came from, you know? So, um, but jazz never was really a thing for me, you know? It was just, um, it was just a thing that was there, you know? It's just a stepping stone to where I went. Yeah. You mentioned that after high school, when you got your GED, you then went to the Art Institute of Fort Lauderdale. Uh, what brought you there? Um, it was just the circumstances in my life gave me a lot of extra time and I needed to fill it. And sex, drugs, and rock and roll were my thing. So, um, and we knew... Uh, um, the person that ran the program there was a friend, and I just felt it was something that, you know, I would do, you know, something that I loved. I try not to do things that I don't like, so, I mean, I learned everything there, you know. I learned all kinds of production, you know. I can do a newscast, or I can make a video for your company, you know. We can do whatever you need to do, I learned there, you know. Editing, you know. It was the beginning of that. So that tape, you know, I was learning um, sampling rates and just, you know, a lot of things that went on to help me with what I did. So I don't even know if I still have some of those that tapes around, but that was really an interesting time in music. Do you remember what kind of music you were working on at that time, early on at your time at the Art Institute? So, yeah, definitely. So, um, when I got into the Art Institute, there was like a whole Puerto Rican thing going on down here, like Dr. Shrinkfish, Puya, Nonpoint Factor, uh, all those guys. So we were just throwing like house parties and stuff. Um, my first actual show um, was in the parking lot of the Art Institute. You know, we plugged in right in the parking lot and played right there, you know, on level three, whatever it was. So it was like kind of guerrilla, guerrilla concerts, you know, it was um pretty cool warehouses and stuff like that. So nothing that was as, as organized as it got later on, you know, but those were the days, you know, and a lot of those guys made it out of here, you know, so um, Rob and Nonpoint, those guys did very well for themselves. And Puya, I mean, like, honestly, Puya was like, I don't know that anything like them has existed, you know. They were Whisker Biscuit back then. But that was the first genre. Um, it was just a click of guys, you know, that Kermit, uh, Jer Jerry was actually in school with me, so. But um, yeah, man, that whole scene there. I don't know if you're familiar with that scene, but yeah. All those yeah, guys. yeah, I'm familiar with some of it. Nonpoint more so, because that kind of came up when they were just starting out after they had changed their name from Nonpoint Factor. So was that one of the first times that you had saw them play or had you seen them play before that? Yeah, I seen them play when they got here. I mean, they were like, I was invited to a house party where Whisker Biscuit it was, and like, yeah, right off the bat, I think it's Ramon was like a classically trained dude, and you could tell like it was it was the real deal. But I had been around a lot of music before. I wasn't in the art institute, but I was kind of in the scene. You know, like Brad was a good friend. You know, I know Brian, um, so all the Manson guys, and uh, I actually auditioned for Love Canal back in the day. So Chad and you had the itch, the funk, you know, all these kinds of bands that were around here just doing their thing. Um, 
Not a lot of them made it out of here, but a lot of them did have talent. You know, so. Sure. About South Florida talent was not a lot of national bands came here back in the day that were worth a fuck. You know, they had, I'm sorry, all the commercial um, Aerosmith, whatever, you know, they'd be here. Um, I like to think we had a hand in actually getting uh, different bands down here. Um, one of my best friends, his older brother was a uh, roommates with Dan Barnett from, um, I don't know if you know Dan, but he was uh, the vice president of Cellar Door at the time, which became Ticketmaster. So he would ask us like what bands we were seeing in California. And, you know, it was like Mookie Blaylock and uh, just a lot of those Seattle bands that were coming down and playing in, in California where we were at in Northern California. So we would turn them on to those bands and, um, and, Dan was kind of like a mentor to me, you know, like kind of gave me direction and like, um, like the first thing he asked me is, what do you want to do? And I really couldn't figure out what I wanted to do because everything just seemed so palatable. Like, it's like, I want to do it all, you know, it's like, let's, you know. Um, I never got a chance to intern for him. Um, and I did um, actually fill out all the paperwork and meet with Jack Boyle at Fantasma, but I wound up with Fat Harry, you know, so I don't know if you know Fat Harry, but Fat Harry Productions and Bob Slade and right. Jim Hayward and Tom Bowker and it was just a crew of guys that I would do all different kinds of things with, but I, I don't know that I'm on your question anymore, so let's get back to what you were asking. No, it's all good. No, because we're going to get into that. I'm glad you brought some of those names up. I want to talk a little bit about the audition that you brought up with Love Canal. What do you remember from that process? Um, just that, like, I was told that I sounded too much like the drummer from Tool, and um, it wasn't going to work out. So, like, at that point, I realized that, um, I was starting to realize that, okay, so there's a lot of rejection here, and, like, I don't really like that. And, like, being a drummer just doesn't sound like anything other than a job, you know, like I'm somebody's bitch, you know, basically. And I wasn't, I, w I really wasn't feeling it anymore, you know, so I just, I've heard it before that I just lay on the tongues, you know, that's, uh, that's where I'm getting my, I mean, it's just, it is what it is. I mean, not too much. I don't play like that so much anymore, but it was just, it was just what was going on at the time, you know, like corn to all those guys were like, they're keeping time with their floor time, you know. <laughs> They're not keeping time with symbols, you know. It's just like it was what it was, and and it, it kind of put, put me in a different direction because honestly, I know a lot of professional drummers, and I don't envy any of them. You know, it's not it's not the best position to be in. Singer songwriters, you, you gotta love those guys, but. Drummer, it just seems like a job, you know. You might as well be a roadie because they're they're going to replace you with a roadie one day. Yeah, that's a good point. Did you ever play any shows with any bands while you were playing the drums? No, oh, I wanted to play for Rob Elba though, like on the uh, rock opera thing that he was doing. Oh yeah, yeah. He had he had Andre, but that's the only thing I really wanted to do because there was just so many people. Um, but unfortunately, well, or fortunately, he had Andre, so it didn't work out. But I've really haven't had the desire until recently to actually um, play with people. There's just, I don't know, there's just something about it where so many personalities and trying to get everything. It's just, it's just a lot of work just to get to the point where you're actually playing with people, you know. It's, and then there's always some kind of drama, you know. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> and so, thanks I mean, to Rob for getting us connected too, because uh, you know, Rob and you actually, I know we're gonna get to this a little bit later when we get into the whole uh uh purple skunk side of what you did, but uh you did put out a holy terrors record or a CD, right? So there's that connection. Yeah, as well. we, did, we, did put, we did put some holy terror stuff out there. Yeah. yeah, you did. So uh during this time, right, there's obviously a lot of other bands that are going on. You mentioned a couple so far. Uh, do you remember some others that maybe you were seeing and what were some of the places you were going to some of the different venues, clubs, bars, that sort of thing that was putting on some of those shows? I mean, there's always been a strong music scene down here because you got to entertain drunk people somehow. So it's just a thing. 
as a kid, there was like a million metal bands, like Tough Luck and, you know, their clones, <laughs> whoever. And then there was like Gypsy Queen, on the other hand, where they were like girls that were getting up there and doing their thing. So there's always been a strong music scene down here. And um, it's been easy to be part of it, you know. Um, you just show up and talk to people, you know. It's, um, but um, I don't know if, the, if there was something specific in the question that I missed. I'm sorry. Yeah, so you brought up some names. Now, I do like Tough Luck. Did you ever see them back then? If so, what were they like? Lots of hair, lots of noise. I mean, like, <laughs> they, I'm sure they opened up for like anthrax or somebody at one point at the Button South. But and I learned early on it really wasn't about the band for me. It was about the venue. Okay, so you can put anybody on stage, and they're either going to suck or they're not going to suck. But the venue is what gave them a chance, you know. And that's where I took that's where I took um, to heart later on. And my career was just like making sure that the artists were able to put on their best show, you know, like, because without everything, I mean, even the best bands can suck, you know, if the sound isn't right or if the right guys aren't on stage, you know, or if the right guys aren't, you know, mixing you. Or, it's just, it's just, I think that's the most crucial part of the show, honestly. Did you find because you were also going to school for this, that you were also uh, very uh, observant, even more so during the performances where you would you would give critique or you would kind of think that in your head. Was that going on at that point too for you? No flaw got past me. I mean, honestly, um, when it came to production, I just mean everything had to be right. I understood sound. I understood what was going on with it. Um, if you were my guy... <laughs> You knew it was coming, you know, it was like we had to be on point. So um, most of my guys ro rose to the cream of the crop out there, you know. So, um, you know, Andre Serafini and Jim and that whole crew from Beach Sound, you know, those were my guys. You know? so Andre actually had his first gig with me down in Homestead, uh, this place called Mars Bar that we had. Uh, my friends gave me the keys to it to do shows. So that was my first that was my first venue that was just me, you know. Was that Quit or was that a different band? Andre Andre had Quit back then. They played they played some shows. But that's where Shrinkfish and all those guys actually made uh, Mark for their names because um, this was really the beginning of the local scene that's blowing it up down here. Um, so I don't know if I'm off track or not. I, I, do you want to get into this? Or? Yeah, let's get in. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so... Um, it was uh, Mark Vasu, uh, Joe Delaney, my, um, Dave Lags, uh, and uh, Hank Long, which is a dear friend of mine. And um, I know I forget, Shannon Miller. Yeah. So all those guys were partners. They did Cafe Iguanas, and they did um, Blue Martini, I think, and they did the Mars Bar. And the Mars Bar was the alternative. So to give you context, these guys also did confettis back in the day where they had reunion room. So this was kind of like, so that's the first time I met Mike Harris was when they were do, putting up the song. I had a nice little rise, maybe a foot and a half uh, stage that was beautiful, great sound. Like everything was perfect in that room. Um, but the only thing that sucked was like, it was a second floor room, so everything had to come up in the elevator or up the stairs, you know. So, so that's murder on the, the, you know, like half your crew's dead by the time, you know. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but it was just such a flawless venue and the sound was so perfect. Um, that's where I was able to do like uh, Lord's Acid, Dink. Um, we did, uh, what was it? Google Dolls. I mean, I did some decent bands in that room. Um, but the, the thing was to like know when bands in a room like that, know when bands are about to blow up, you know. Know that you're doing a band that's about to blow up. They're they're a little, they're still a little baby band, but you know they're on their way. And the way you know they're on their way for sure is when they start rolling in some, you know, twenty thousand dollars worth of equipment, you know. Or, or they come in on a tour bus, you know, because somebody's got their back, you know, they're putting 
they're putting effort into this band. So that's right. Right. Uh, so being on the cusp of these bands blowing up were, was huge for us, you know, uh, as promoters. I mean, like our first corn show that we did, we ruined the club, you know, because they blew up over. I I was nervous about that show, you know. It's like, but the the show exploded. The venue exploded. Like it got torn to shreds. It was crazy, you know. Where was that at? Club Impact in um, Papano. So that was their first tour coming through here. Those guys were great, man. So, so you, said, I mean, that, you, you said that they tore it up. Like, so was there just was there a lot of violence at that show, or was it just just a crazy show where it was more so I the band? Say violence. I wouldn't say violence because, like, um, the way I had my security was, I mean, there was a lot of factions of, I, I want to say, gangs or whatever, like down here. So the thing was, and my security was. I had somebody from everything, you know, it's like, you guys want shows, you're going to have to get along, you're going to have to keep your people right. I mean, we're talking about the hardcore stuff, you know, so I did a lot of New York City hardcore and stuff like that. So, um, but you, but that worked out well, you know, I mean, there was maybe one incident where the uh, bass player from Total Chaos was getting boot party from, um, from some Nazi skins, but by the time the night was over, they were best friends, you know. So, <laughs> I mean, there. I mean, once in a while, when Bob or somebody would put on like a punk band with some hardcore, that's when shit would get a little crazy, you know, because you got punks in here and you got some hardcore guys. But everything would always. Uh, I mean, I don't know of any real anybody that got hurt really bad, except for like a House of Pain show. Um, some lady got her orbital crushed or whatever. But that we'll talk about that later because that. That's like a crazy, one of the crazy, crazy ones. You, know? yeah. so. you mentioned Bob Slade earlier, and his name has come up many times on the podcast with other guests. But let's talk about him for a moment and what are your memories of of, of knowing him and uh, that relationship over the years? So um, Bob Slade came into my life because of Harry Tyler. So um, I guess Bob was like, a, a, he had a relationship with a, Stormy Shepherd and Sarah Vale. And she was doing like a lot of the, like, well, baby bands that were like huge bands now, like Offspring and Green Day. Like um, she had like Rants, all that whole, you know, she was the early, her, Sarah and Stormy were the early um, booking agents for those bands. So, I mean, a lot of fat records stuff. I mean, and Bob had his shit together, you know, but Bob came into my life because I was an intern, you know, so I looked into this situation where, um, I mean, my first shows were honestly Nine Inch Nails and uh, Offspring and like, I'm like a runner and this and that. And I saw my way in right away because these guys were struggling for money and I had, that was something that I could help with right off the bat. So, and and I knew what I was doing, you know, you give me a job, whatever it is, it's going to, um, it's going to take off, but me and Bob, we didn't, I mean, I guess I kind of became partners with everybody that was promoting um, because I would go find the venues, you know? So I would walk into a club and I would be like, Hey, do you guys want to do national acts here? You know? And they'd be, at first I have to look at the sight lines, make sure it would work, like at the power and stuff like that. And then I go on with my guys with some, um, <laughs> two by eights and build some stages, you know, it's, you know, it's pretty easy shit, you know, um, and then make sure I got power, you know, so I had a, a good feel for all that stuff, you know, so I understood all that stuff. I knew what kind of power I needed, how many phases, you know, amps, you know, how to tie into it, you know, you know, so all those things, you know, put me right in with these guys, you know, I was, so, so Bob had the LRN show and I had Mars Bar and, um, he was doing his thing. I was doing my thing down at Mars Bar, right? So uh, with Mars Bar, I did this promotion on Fridays with Budweiser. Well, I guess the club did it, not me. So, and it was Dollar Long Necks. And then we brought in WSHE to do a uh, live remote from there. And that kind of spun into the local show on She and like um, just a lot of things that gave... I was talking to Glenn Richards about this a little bit when I saw him at like some kind of thing that, that Rob has going on every year, the continuum. So and it was just 
everything came together and a lot of bands were able to take advantage of that. The main thing about Mars Bar though was on Friday night with the Dollar Long Necks, Universal was down in Miami right there. So those guys were in there every night. So that's how these guys got signed, you know, at one point. Oh yeah, like all those guys. So I would give them 250 bucks and all the long necks they could drink, you know? So, and that was their night to showcase. So um, you had the radio station, you had radio people, I mean, music people, and it was just a great thing. But getting back to Bob, Bob was doing the LRN show and he had load and the record label and just like, he had a really good feel for what was going on and locally. Um, I really didn't have that same knowledge at that point, you know, so I depended on Bob to bring me up to speed, you know, and he did a great job of that, you know. So um, it was, it was just a time and a place and a person that everything came together and not, nothing was ever the same for me when Bob left, you know, to go to Colorado and do whatever he did there. Um, but I know he was responsible for a lot of things that happened good in South Florida. Um, I don't know why he left or wh what he's doing in Colorado. And I mean to reach out to him constantly, but I mean, decades have gone by and I haven't. You know? Right. He did something special, you know, so. Sure. Um, but I would co-promote with Slade and co-promote with Jim Hayward because Jim was doing kind of metal stuff, slammy stuff, you know. And then uh, Bowker, I did a lot of stuff with Bowker. Bowker was out. In fact, I think Bowker still out. He toured with one of my drum sets forever. You know, like <laughs> he's he's a purchaser of one of my old kids. But he was doing stuff that was kind of cutting edge, whatever. I, I don't know what stuff like that. So I had all these different promoters that I would work with because I was with the vendor, you know. I was like, I, I made sure that we had sound. You know, one time I had rented a sound system for this place called the Attic, which later became the Prop Room and the Theater, which that was a huge venue for us, you know. Cell 63. I, I remember the Prop Room. I think I saw, I saw several shows there, uh, Deftones obituary amongst others and it was a uh, it was a pretty small little spot right above the the theater nightclub but it shredded man that place had a great sound it had like i mean honestly it had great sight lines there's nowhere in that room where you couldn't see that stage was set up like so awkward and like but it worked perfectly and like the sound had to be like i had to have a delay on the sound to get everything right you know just because of the way the sound was coming at the walls, you know, the reflections were just horrible. So it took a minute to get the sound right in there. But but once we got it right, you know, it's just, you couldn't really, I don't, for me, that's one of the best rooms ever. Because, I mean, it was just nothing but love in there. Love and hardcore. <laughs> but that's where the boot party happened on the Total Chaos guy. And, and that guy's like six foot eight, you know, so. We drug him in the bathroom and like, Braced the door so nobody could come in and they got on the mic and just started letting people know hey do you like concerts or not <laughs> and that seems to always be the prevailing thing like hey this is the end of the shows if you guys can't get your shit together you know like right a, a lot of what you were talking about with the sound and all the things that were getting put on from the from a production perspective how much of that would you say you learned from your time at the florida institute or was this stuff you were learning from other people as you were doing it or just learning by just doing it and trial and error? How much of that would you say was from the school and just from the other side of it? Well, school makes sure you understand sound. You know? They make sure you understand production. Um, you're out there representing that school. So, I mean, they're not trying to not teach you. So, like, everything I, I learned pretty much was either self-taught or um i mean except for like some of the business stuff you know I, like i just learned some stuff uh a week ago with fat harry because i'm trying to help some people in california right now do a do a um a festival out there a 420 festival it didn't go off this year because the pr people that they had doing the 
uh, promoting and the bands and stuff, the promoter they brought in just had little Wayne and this and I and backed out at the last minute. So I had to bring Harry in and Zoom my buddy. And, and uh, so I learned stuff that's going on in the music business now. Um, like, cause things are different now than what they were then. Back then they appreciated the little guys, you know? Um, now they, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> they just want to stomp you out at this point, you know? So, But lucky for me, I've got a lot of uh, history with a lot of bands. And, um, and Harry told me how I could get stuff done for my buddy. So it's like, you got to park money with a major label. I'm not major label, with a, a major booking agency, and then they'll let you start shopping. They just want to know that the money's there. So you escrow the money, and then you're good to go. So there's no saying no to that. You know? Right. It's <laughs> to true. Fly, to fly in, you don't have to buy, bet um, bet against Live Nation or anybody. So um, that's that's your key into doing shows at this point. Sure. But I definitely learned some stuff from my guys, though, like because um, I'd say every piece of equipment's different, you know. So um, everything's going to do do you better. Even though I understood like the amplifiers and the sub and the mids and the high, and the high mid, the high low, low mid, like I I got all that, and I just didn't know what was the right thing to be powering that. So. That I would learn from my guys. And that was trial and error through stuff that they bought and threw away, you know. So and then also mics, you know. Um, there mics weren't as much uh, a thing live because that was SM, you know, 57, 56. But when it came to the studio, I think, Jesus Christ, <laughs> you got hundred thousand dollars in mics just trying to figure out, you know, how to get sound into a board properly so um, but yeah so i guess it's a little bit of both is the answer to your question okay yeah so you mentioned the studio was this the dungeon or did you have something that predated that well i had the dungeon and then i i don't know if you know spiky from uh from you know do you know spiky spiky goldbach yeah 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 i don't That's know him personally but i know the bands he's been in yeah so I set up something with Spiky also, but the dungeon was the only recording studio that I did. And it was kind of a fluke because, so with what I was doing live, it was about just entertainment. For me, it wasn't ever about the money. It was just about um, seeing bands that I liked, honestly, and hanging out and chilling and having something to do, you know, a community, you know. So when, um, when all these bands started getting signed, I'm like, dude, I'm fucking doing something right here. You know, like, and I, I didn't realize what it was at the time, but um, later on, I figured everything out around Limp Biscuit when Limp Biscuit got signed. So um, that's when the studio kind of happened for me because I needed to try to develop these acts fully because I was developing them on stage and they were getting signed. You know? So it was a plethora of bands that just made it off those stages. And, for me, like it was always imperative that I had an opening spot for somebody local that was worthy. So I would tell these guys, whoever it might be, just this is your shot, dude. There's 2,500 people in here, you know, like you got to rock this room, bro. And like, um, if I were you, I play bigger than this room. I play like it's a fucking stadium if I were you, bro, because um, people need to see that you can be bigger than what's going on in this room. So now, once they rocked the room, which many of them were able to do, you were able to start developing them as an act that's doing local shows, you know. They couldn't play every week, but, you know, if you're spreading it out six, eight weeks, you can get a decent... If I could get a 1,000 people to pay for that band to see them live, Harry could get them signed to management. It was as simple as that. So I didn't realize what we were doing at the time, but we were making people fucking rock stars, <laughs> basically. Yeah. Was there a yeah. local band at that time that you felt like was drawing more than some of the others were? Um, I mean, like, there's a lot of bands that got to that point. When I first started, I don't think there was. Maybe Brian, maybe Manson, you know. Um, I don't. 
everybody had their little crew or whatever, but for me, it was about getting a thousand people through that door, you know, having to be in a venue that could hold a thousand people. You know? So I don't know. I don't know that there was that many bands back then that were actually had a huge shot. Um, but it definitely changed. Right. I mean, Triple A got there. I mean, that. I mean, Beck and Andy's got there. I mean, everybody got there, and they were playing in front of. They were playing like. Honestly, there's been songs stolen on that stage from major major acts from the baby acts. So, so literally songs were stolen. <laughs> so so you know something's going right. But and one of the other bands you mentioned, Limp Biscuit, who were out of Jacksonville. So were you also at this time paying attention to other bands from Florida that were outside of the South, maybe in other parts of the state? There, there was a point where I did, and because I was looking for talent to sign. So there was the, um, in Orlando, there used to be a, I forget um, what it was called, a music, whatever. Like it was all local throughout the state, you know. And it was in Orlando once a year. So it's escaping me right now the name of it. But yeah, I would find talent there. Um, I didn't really sign anybody from that. It, 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 it was all local for some reason, you know. There were bands. Well, I guess Matt Gregoric wasn't from here. He was just friends with people from here. But yeah. so Matt Gregoric had already done a lot of stuff. He was a touring musician and stuff like that when we did By the Lights. I guess he would be the only person that um, I brought in to the label from uh, from outside of uh, South Florida. When you say the label, what was the label called at that time? Purple Skunk Records. And then I went on to do Perch Records later on. Was Purple Skunk the first venture you ever took into uh, putting out music? Yeah, because it was just live shows up until then. You know, it was kind of like the record label came because I had done such a good job at the shows. I saw that I was missing out on the monetary benefits of what I did, you know, because I'm developing bands, <clears throat> but I'm not developing bands, you know, so. But the thing was, I had the skills to do everything, so why not, you know, just, um, I started by um, paying for a couple of records. Uh, I guess it was weird because a friend of mine, they got me into the studio on a whim. So a my buddy who built the stages for me, one of his guys had a band called Speed Load. <clears throat> so they asked me to, you know, produce a record and stuff. And I came in the studio and I was just like, this is what's missing. I, I got it, you know. So I paid for that record and I paid for another record that I was going to do with either Vacant Andes or Quit, you know, because those were the only two bands I really wanted to work with right then and there. And you know what happened. <laughs> so it's like, uh, Addy just broke you know, broke his arm in a million pieces and quit was like never, quit, you know, quit, quit. <laughs> it was basically, right. and then, and then, you know, what happened with Chris. So it was just like, uh, I always meant to go back and do a record with Chris at some point, um, but it just, it never happened. Yeah. What was it about those bands, though, that really connected with you that you wanted to work with them out of all the different bands happening in the scene? What was it about those in particular? There was, okay, there's a professionalism that people have that um, just comes across as like, I'm thirsty for knowledge. Uh, and, and then they could write songs, you know, it's like, um, there's just, there's a song structure that um, if you're aware of it, you can pick it out. You know somebody's got their shit together. You know? so, um, and both those bands had that. You know, so, and, and they had stage presence. They could rock a room. Both those got those. Both those bands had opened up national shows for me. So I knew that they had what it took. You know, and Quit had already been touring. Like, I mean, the, fucking Green Day was opening up for Quit. You know, so honestly, uh, I couldn't have picked better bands. Honestly, just. I picked them a little late. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sometimes obviously, you know, timing can, can play a big, a big part in that. 
so do you, what do you remember about the very first release on on Purple Skunk? That was about Anchorman. So that's the first record we made. So that was um, basically Vic and Andy's minus Chris. Um, so I, fear, I think Hawkins was on that record. Was it Hawkins or Rob Helmsburg? I forget. Well, I'm sorry. But it was my first chance to work with James Wisner. And um, James was doing some amazing stuff. It was all digital out of his house. And it was just like, I'm pretty sure, I think we did drum somewhere else, but it was just an interesting record to make. Because you know? there were things that I wanted on the record that I was able to share with James. And there was things that I learned from him, you know. And he's an incredible, incredible talent, you know. So, so that's honestly the unsung heroes and bands are these guys who help with the arrangements and get it on tape and you know it's well not in that case it was on whatever digital I don't even think that was that I think it was the beginning of uh Pro Tools. But uh so I just remember that we had some fart we had some amazing songs, you know. And then um lucky for me I knew Kevin Lyman and we were able to like get our records pressed some some decent merch and then we bum rushed work tour and like did our best to try to get Anchorman off and running, you know? And that was the season smart ass CD album. Is that, is that right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So you mentioned about the warp tour. So was it planned to have them play or was it one of the situations where you just kind of got them in there somehow? Like how did that come about? So, um, we actually did the first warp tour show at, um, I guess it was the edge back there in the parking lot. Um, so Harry has a long standing relationship with uh, Kevin because Kevin's done a lot of stuff before Warp Tour and since. So I don't know if you're familiar with Kevin Lyman, but he's like the production god out there. You know, he's just like, he's that guy, you know, he turned production into a business and he's just. I don't know. I don't know that anybody really compares to Kevin Lyman. If they do, I haven't met him yet, you know, so. But he's just such a sweetheart of a guy. And I knew that I could bum rush any warp Tour show, just show up and he'd put us on a stage, you know. I usually had a case of wine in the, in the trailer for the girls in the office, but, um, you know, he's just a great guy. I, I can't I can't thank him enough. Were you in the audience when Anchorman played that? that warp tour and what was the reaction like that was strange because i think we did like three shows or something I, I can't remember i know we were in louisiana we were in i can't remember exact shows we played there's just so many shows in my head but i know i had brought some guys to film it and i don't even know what happened to the film but i i'm sure i saw i'm sure i saw the side i just don't you know there's so many sets um I do remember like having to go somewhere and do something at some point. But when we were on our way to the first show, um, the guys if the guys were in the van in front of us and I was one of my cousins was with me and, and the truck I was driving. And all of a sudden I see like the hood blow up from the van and like all this craziness going on with the vans off the side of the road. Um, the guys hit a, a, a bull. <laughs> On 95, and they destroyed the van. And one of the guys broke his foot. We didn't even know. Oh, I think it was Charlie who broke his foot. And we didn't even know that we were going to get to play, but we were there waiting for him. And, and he actually made it. So, so, so um, that did was, you, that sounds like a crazy, crazy story. So, did you have a lot of those situations where you were all, you were going on the road with a lot of bands too? And if so, where were uh, some of those places you were uh, going to? No, I would just do stuff local, like okay. more, like when we had the bum rush, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so anything else where the guys, it was legit, you know. They were on tour with whoever. Um, we had a fifteen passenger van. I had a fifteen passenger van. I had backline Cellini cases. Um, uh, trailer. The guys always had the right merch, just because I knew that's what it took. I know people notice what you're rolling in there. You know, it's like. I wanted these guys to get a little respect out there, you know, so. So we had everything we needed to, you know, everything was there. 
for yeah. whoever, whatever. So while some of these bands were on the road in the van, what was your primary focus at that moment in South Florida? I would just, there was always another band or whatever that I had going on back then. Um, but I, I would do my, like, sometimes there'd be a publicist I might have to deal with whatever, send whatever. But we got records wherever we could along the way. We had an Amazon where we were selling stuff. Um, so we didn't have distributing at the time. So that, that was a huge part of being successful at the time was distributing. So What was the challenge so with to, that, with getting distributing? I guess just, I mean, either getting the right person behind you or it was a money thing, you know, you could, you could stroke anything in your life, honestly, if you got the right amount of money, but um, I don't know. Eventually we were there. We could have, I mean, you know, we had, we had a chance for distributing, but um, I guess, what's his name? Uh, what's that guy's name? Osama Bin Laden fucked that up for me, I guess. <laughs> That's the only way I could put it, you know, so, you know, September 11th, you know, so that fucked everything up for everybody. We were literally supposed to have our showcase on September 11th. So, you know, not a good day for anybody, especially Purple Sky Records. Yeah, no, that was definitely one of the most tragic days in our history. So when that showcase was supposed to go on, do you remember what bands were supposed to play and what venue that was supposed to be at? Yeah, we were doing it at the studio. And so the lawyer, Jay Reed Hunter, he came down here and cherry picked um he cherry picked Irish Car Bomb. And I think the second band was quit. Dan Bonebreak was playing bass at that point and quit. So so those are the two bands that we were gonna showcase. Now Irish Car Bomb was uh members of Radio Baghdad. Uh, and perhaps some others as well. So what was your memories getting a chance to work with them? And then you put out a, re a record of theirs as well. Well, I mean, I've known Pete since he was a kid showing up at shows and stuff, you know, so. And, and I knew Hawkins from um, Anchorman. He had a, he played guitar for um, those guys for a minute. So, so they had um, formed a band with Shannon I don't know if you know Shannon Gabriel, but he's a huge part of um, that band. I had a lot of connections. So um, he was a touring, uh, you know, sound, sound, whatever. I'm not sure. Guitar tech, different things he would do, you know. Um, but for a lot of Fat Record bands, he was good friends with Fat Mike. So, so Fat Mike enters the scene and all that stuff for us. But <clears throat> So it was kind of a, a bunch of friends, you know, and these guys were serious. They wanted to do something and they could write songs, you know. You had, you had three legitimate songwriters in there and Pete, Pete could write too. He was coming up at that point, you know. Um, so he's got some great, great songs that he wrote with Carbon, you know. So I don't know if he wrote with Baghdad at all. That was mostly Spiky, I think. Um, but I know that... Uh, all three of the, everybody was writing songs for that for that band. So and it was kind of eclectic because it would be all over the place. But um Fat Mike was really into the pop punk stuff that Spikey was writing at the time. But he would literally refuse to write any more of it. <laughs> Once Mike was interested, I don't know if it was the Mike interested thing or Spikey was just over it. I never really talked to him about it. Yeah. But I got nothing but love for Spikey. You know, he's a great guy. And I had set up like a, a little mini studio at his house. So there's always people coming in there and demos for me to listen to and shit he was working on. So that was all digital stuff that he was doing. And a lot of times we could go into the studio and just track drums and then like everything else would go on digitally. DI, baby. Get your DI going. <laughs> because you came from the drums, right? Did you enjoy tracking drums and perhaps a little bit more or did it not matter to you uh at that point in your in your career so the thing about drums was that if you weren't a phenomenal drummer you didn't have a place in this label you know it's just it's as simple as that a band is only as good as their drummer so 
Unless you were a fucking beast, you were not on this label. So, yeah, <laughs> it was all about the drums. They needed to punch through, yeah, Fugazi style, baby. Let's get this going. Did you ever get a demo that perhaps initially you were just not feeling and then you look back on it and you kind of wish maybe you would have done something more with that or any, any situation like that ever happened? I don't think so. I mean, like, it, it's just like a moment and you move on, you know, it's not like anything to dwell on. It's just music. I mean, honestly, um, one, two, three, four. <laughs> I mean, uh, there's sure. not much fun. <laughs> People don't understand how easy it is. It's just like uh, a scale is only go, only goes so high. You know, it's like uh, music is like one of the easier things in life as far as I'm concerned. But I don't know that I asked your question, but there, I, I have no regrets, you know. Yeah. Maybe some of the business decisions I made and people I got in bed with might have been a mistake. But um, other than that, it's just been, a, you know, the love of my life, honestly. It gave me a, a, a purpose, a sense of being, you know. Did you archive at all at that point? Like, were you collecting any of the flyers and the things that you were a part of? Or was that kind of just, everything was kind of just come and go and you weren't really hanging on to much of that stuff? Yeah, it's just like, I'm not a, I'm not a hoarder. It's like, I don't do hoarding very well. So I just didn't care. It was just like, I was in it for nothing more than the love of it. You know, I don't need the moment of it you know it's like i got all the records to remind me you know like that i threw away at some point you know <laughs> you can only carry around records so long before you're like here you go sure. <laughs> do you still have any in your collection that you have hung on to that you just have not let go for whatever reason sentimental or whatever the situation is i got a couple of copies of everything just you know, in case I'm about, I, I'm about to like do a YouTube channel and, and start monetizing the stuff because it's just sitting there and I might as well make some money for myself. I mean, whatever money the guys make on publishing or whatever, you know, chances are if something breaks even one day, they'll get 50% of whatever um, is coming in. Because my contracts were always righteous, you know, if somebody blew up, they were getting paid, you know, but they had to blow up, you know, it was like, that's not on me. I can only give you everything you need. And then you have to do your thing, you know. It's like, I don't know that um, too many people took it as a serious um, endeavor, you know. Sure. Yeah. Did you have a situation where perhaps someone felt like they earned more than they did at that point and you kind of had to bring them back down to reality? Oh, there was one, one person um, one instance um but i mean that was the end of that band honestly for me you know like it didn't go any further the record got done it got shelved and they did whatever they did you know a couple scumbag moves but i mean a lot of that stuff is like and it's drugs drug addiction. people just uh, don't have a clue you know and so it's easy to forgive people you know mm -hmm and move on from shit like that so yeah for me i don't i don't i don't carry any anything any animosity any kind of uh hate or anything like that it just doesn't work for me you know yeah and because that was also a big part of what was going on right a lot of as you mentioned earlier when we first got started you know sex drugs and rock and roll you know the drugs part you know how much of an influence did that have in the scene at the time that you were really a part of it and putting on a lot of what you were doing I think drugs have always been a scene, you know, probably since the acid test and hate Ashbury, you know, like it was the hate Ashbury that they did that. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> it all goes, you know, it all goes, it's all one, you know, it's like that's what I guess um sex leads to drugs or drugs leads to sex, rock and roll, you gotta have something. <laughs> it's all like it all works together. For some reason it's like a dish that you cook, you know. <laughs> yeah. All the places. It just it's just always been part of the scene. It's been different drugs, 
over the years, you know, you're seeing uh, when I was a kid, it was all people doing cocaine and alcohol and like, um, then it turned to like psychedelics and, <clears throat> and ecstasy and all that kind of stuff. And, and then like, it was a free for all, <laughs> like everything kind of on that, you know, yeah. then the opiate crisis and stuff, you know, so. It's just part of the society, you know. It, society bleeds into whatever kind of entertainment's going on. Were you also on the cusp of what was happening when there was that switchover in the '90s, and the rave scene started to pick up in South Florida? Were you also a part of that too, in some way? Well, we didn't do a lot of it, but we did some. Yeah, um, that Lord's Acid Dink, all those, all those guys. Yeah, we did a big festival in Miami at one point, and way before Ultra. Yeah, so. But it just wasn't my thing, you know. I mean, it was, it was what it was, you know. I just, it just wasn't my thing. My thing was, like my label, it's hardcore, ska, punk, everything in between. So that's just where I lived. Yeah. Not that I didn't appreciate good music, wherever it was coming from. It was just my forte. What made me go, you know, like, like. The first time I heard Dashboard and John Ralston stuff, I like what what do you do with this? <laughs> like what, do I go home and cry? Like <laughs> what the fuck am I how do you do like I couldn't I didn't see where that could go. I, I mean like I couldn't even envision it. Um Amy so were, could. But... Were you surprised when it when it when it did catch on? Not not so much because of Chris, you know. I knew who Chris was. I knew Chris since he was a kid. He was always asking questions. He was a great songwriter. You know, he was put this, he was lighting fires wherever he went, you know, like he was just, he was a talent, you know. Um, so that didn't surprise me at all. I just didn't know that there was a market for that kind of stuff. I didn't know that you could sell it to people's girlfriends, you know, so. But once, it, once he started touring, it was over, you know. It's just like he didn't give a fuck who he played in front of. He was just gonna play every night he could, and that's all shit that he learned as a kid. Like you gotta get out there and play. It doesn't matter what it is. You gotta play. You gotta get in front of people, because that's the only chance you have. And you know, he's a. I mean, he's a great person. You know, his hospitality has been just unbelievable. You know, he made sure. We had a gold record, you know, he did everything he could to look out for friends and family down here. I've got nothing but great things to say about Chris. I think you also mentioned Amy before. Was that Amy Fiddler? Amy, was that who you were talking about just a second ago? Yeah, um, yeah Amy was, uh, she, uh, first time I met her, she was doing flyers. Like she's picking up flyers from my house, you know, so. Um, the next thing I knew, she was doing stuff over at Cheers, and um, she had her own little scene going, and just great to see, you know. And, <clears throat> and I guess she was playing Chris's record, and Rich Egan heard it, you know, and that was that. There was bye bye, Chris. <laughs> bye bye, Dick and Angie's record. Bye bye, whatever. <laughs> but good for him, man. Good for him. And some, some really high up people took notice of him and you know I want to say groomed him but it's not really a good word so like mentored him so so and like honestly and from him being mentored to, mentored by these people you know there's things that he was able to share with me later on that helped me you know so it was just an amazing thing to see happen to somebody that you care for you know? Yeah. Was there anything that you, anything specific that you got from Chris that perhaps he did share with you that you think maybe helped you in your life or your career? I mean, one of the biggest lessons I learned was from Chris, you know, and like, it really didn't have a lot to do with music. It just had something to do with a situation that was negative that I shared with him and that he let me know that, um, that it wasn't a good feeling to hear that. And it wasn't like um, something that, you know, it was just something I should have never shared. You know, it was a moment that I had that I didn't need to, you know, share with him. But it just, 
it, it was one of the biggest lessons in my life, honestly. Like that, that everything you hear and see needs to be shared with people. And maybe one day we're we're not. If I see you, whatever, I'll, I'll tell you. But so, well, when we're not, like, <laughs> we're actually not. <laughs> yeah. So no, I, I really appreciate you sharing some of those memories, Tommy, and, and kind of going back to that point. And, you know, you look at some of these bands, right, and how they grew over the years. And, you know, some obviously went on and others maybe maybe didn't. So were there was there maybe a band that, you know, you were just a huge fan of, you know, you, you tried to be a part of what they were doing. And for whatever reason, they just didn't get to that level. Does any one or two bands come to mind that you wish would have gotten to that point that just for whatever reason didn't? Well, you're basically talking about every band on my label. <laughs> Literally, I mean, no joke. <laughs> so I had hoped that for everybody, you know. Did anybody pull it off? I guess Sam, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So, but Sam was just all on the offshoot, you know, he had already made it. So, Sam Figarino from Holy Terrors? Yeah. 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 Let's talk about yeah. Perch for a moment. You know, at what point did Perch start? So um, I did a record, a Seville record with Chris Drukey. And then that brought Mike Marsh into my life. And Mike was like, yeah, you're a good dude. I want to do something with you, but we got to do something separate, you know, because um, it's just like a look, you know, like sex, drugs, and rock and roll weren't working for Mike Marsh, you know, so... Um, so that's how we came about Perch. It's more of a wholesome, like, um, like, you know, non curse word friendly kind of moment. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's how Perch came about. Put a lot of effort and time into that. And so, who were some other bands on that label? You're, that's it. That's the only record that's we did. That's the only one. Yeah, the agent. But that record was. Um, we had distributing through John Wiley's label, so we piggybacked with him. That was a uh, eulogy. That yeah, eulogy. Yeah. Did you have so, any relationship with, with 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 eulogy at that point, or was that the first time you worked with them? That was the first time I worked with John. I mean, John's a sweetheart of a guy, man. I, I love that guy. I, I appreciate everything he did for us, man. He was just just a great guy, you know. I, do you know John? Have you talked with him before? Way back when he has not been on the podcast, but uh, I'm very familiar with the a lot of the stuff that he was doing, uh, both musically and with the label. So, were you very aware of what he was doing at that point, or do or were you learning at that time some of the things that he was doing in the scene? I had I had heard about Eulogy, and it really was on my radar because those guys weren't coming at me for shows or anything. You know? So, the bands that were on my radar were guys that were like dropping off packages. And like, you know, can we play? Can we play? Can we play? You know, so can we open up? Or can we get a show? You know, so there's a lot of packages that I saw that I was just like, no, thank you. <laughs> I have to say, um, Tobar was constantly coming at me with Creed back in the day. And I was just like, I couldn't do it. <laughs> I just, Tobar was just trying to push that band everywhere, bro. Yeah. What was your what was your issue with that? Um, everything. I mean, honestly, it's not my thing. It's not. Yeah, I told him if he's got a punk band, I'd be more glad to listen. You know, Brian wants to do his show. Let me. Let's do it. Yeah. It's just like I just I wasn't feeling that. Like it just didn't meet what I was doing. Yeah. Sure. Not that what they were doing sucked. It just was not my thing. You know understandable so with john Tobar, right. did you did you have a relationship with him before that and and what was that like if you did i didn't really ever have a relationship with john except for i'm trying to get bands into the venue yeah. mostly mars bro he never really crossed my path later on because slade hayward and all those guys were taking care of whatever i just like i just had everybody's back you know i was i would so just FYI, the name of my production company was In Your Face Entertainment. So if you see an old flyer that says another In Your Face production, that's something I was involved in. At what point did that originate? 
in your face yeah that was day one that was like yeah that was my original that was my original thing that i did was in your face entertainment in, in your face entertainment llc baby <laughs> That's where my Ticketmaster money came from. <laughs> all that stuff. Yeah. So you had your hand in all kinds of things, you know. So when you would, you know, wake up and and begin your day, go thinking back in that time, like, can you kind of describe what that was like for you? Because you had your hand in so many different pots. Uh, what would it be a typical day for you back then? I mean, every, every day was different. You know, I mean, like. Just whatever was going on, you know. I just have to put out help, put out fire, whatever it might be. You know, like uh, the one thing that stands out to me is like any, like any of the shows I was doing. Like I had some, like some serious anxiety to where like I would get dry heaves and like whatever. Before, once I got going, I was fine. But, but. I mean, like, I had to have, like, a brand new outfit, brand new shit. I mean, like, I had to be on point. It was like, you never knew who you were going to meet, you know? It was like... Did people know this about you, or was this stuff that you just kind of internalized and no one really saw that side? I don't know that people knew a lot about me. You know, I don't I don't really share a lot, you know? If you were a really close friend, like, um, like Daryl, Daryl's dear friend. Uh, bone break? Yeah, bone break, yeah. Okay. So Daryl, I mean, there's a couple of people that I would talk to that knew me, you know, um, but not a lot of people really, really, you know, they're just, it was just like, I did my thing. I, I was there, whatever my responsibility was, you, you knew it was going to happen. You know, I was going to take care of it. Was, that, was I, that more by choice or was that just like, remember perhaps why that was the case? Um, um, so... I don't think I think I, like I had my own life. I had my own things going on, and it was just like this was a hobby. You know, it wasn't my career. It was it was a love and a passion, but <clears throat> my career was something completely different. You know? So, not that I, I didn't take care of all my responsibilities and would make everything that I had to do a priority. It was just <clears throat> it wasn't my money. You know, it wasn't my. Uh, I wasn't like going to the bank <laughs> with a local show worth of five dollar bills. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so, what, can you speak on maybe perhaps like what else you were doing? Like what else was part of your your career path at that point that you were doing in conjunction to the hobby of putting on the shows and getting being involved with the production side, the recording side, and all that. Um, mm -hmm. It was just. It was just a time in my life where I had a lot of other commitments. And um, yeah, that's probably all I'm going to say. That. Fair enough. <laughs> we'll, see. We'll, we'll save that for the uh, the Tommy Berman book that may come out one day soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. <laughs> so, so you had... Uh, you mentioned Perch, right? That was another label that you had. Again, very, very short-lived. Uh, not a lot going on. Did you ever have any desire to do another label after that? I mean, like, right recently, I've, I've been out in the scene. I don't know if you're familiar with Ginger's. Um, and then um, there's another club called Tough Times. They were doing a bunch of local bands. So I went out to see... Um, I don't know. Somebody got me out, and I, and I realized that it was kind of was it Will Trevor that got me out? I can't remember, but I realized it was a pretty cool little venue, and what they were doing was kind of special, and like kind of gave me a little bit of a vibe of stuff I did early on. So there was a girl there named Willow that um, is booking the bands and stuff. So I tried to mentor her with a little bit of knowledge I uh, I had and introduce her to people that I I knew. Um, so I just, at the point I was looking for maybe somebody to work with, maybe not. And I talked to a couple bands and it was just, there's people that don't even know what publishing is out there. So I can't, I can't help anybody that's actually um, not, doesn't have the savvy, you know. 
And, and the world's a little different now. I understand social media and I understand that I could blow up a band without <clears throat> easily without this distribution now. And I, I get it. I understand what it would take. Um, it's still about getting out there and playing. And But a band has to have knowledge of like where their money's coming from and like be able to do their business, you know, because that's not my business. Their publishing is their business. They have to be on top of that shit. You know, my job is to make sure they have merchandise on the table. My job is to make sure that everything's got a pretty package. You know, my job is to make sure they got the gear to tour with. You know, my job is a lot of things, but it's not counting their money. It's not looking out for their publishing. Unless they want to give me some of it, then that's a whole different thing. You know? right. So that that would bring me into management. You know? So, so I mean, if the right band comes along and, and I see that they're doing the right things, I put them on the right stage and they're able to rock me. Because if you can't rock me, forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> have, your, it. have your taste changed over the years? Like, would you be looking for something different now? Or would it be something that you were familiar with? My taste doesn't change. I mean, um, good music is good music. It doesn't matter what it is. It's just, it's got to be good. You know, it's got to. So the thing that I realize about music is like, it's one of the few things that I can reach out and touch you with and make you feel. So if I can do that through an artist, then I know I got something, you know. But if you're just bored and on your cell phone and this and that and there's nothing really substantially that's drawing you into that song because a song is going to, it's going to grab your soul, bro. And it's going to pull you into it forever. Like, it's like, it's like a, a, a family member that's going nowhere ever, you know, it's going to keep coming and you're going to remember every riff, you're going to remember every song. It's just like, that's like, either you got that or you don't, you know, yeah. it's, just, it's just like a feel. And it's nothing that, I don't know if I even articulated it well, but it's just something that's, you know, you feel it. It's like, you hear it, you feel it. It's just, just one of those things. Is there a song that comes to mind, whether it's from Florida or not, but is there any song that comes to mind that you think really just grabs you in that way and has for the longest time? So there's always a song replacing it for me. <laughs> I, that song will always be there, but I mean, like, and like, it's hard for me to say this, but my the genre of music that I appreciate the most is hardcore. Like it just hands down, like there's just such raw emotion and it's like real, you know. Um, so that's the stuff that jumps out for me all the time, you know. So like Fugazi, Sick of It All, like all those guys are just like they did their thing and they were and they were real all the way through. So I'm glad you brought that up, Tommy, because you mentioned about some of these other genres of music coming into the studio, right? So who were some of the other people working working at the studio that you remember quite well who had a huge hand at the work that was going on at the dungeon at that point? Well, um, I had um, Joe Williams was down there, Jeremy Dubois, Joe Jr. For whatever reason, it's, it's the name's escaping me. And there was, um, what's his name? Oh, I forget. Paul Trust. So all these guys went on to do phenomenal things after the dungeon, you know, so it was quality people there constantly. So that's, those are the good times at the dungeon for me, you know, so. so you, but uh, I, had yeah. A friend, yeah. I, have a friend, I have a friend, Ed Agadello. I don't know if you're familiar with him, but um, when he first came into my life, he was like an intern for uh, Universal, and he um, was handing out like CDs at shows and stuff. And he went out to be like the artist, um, I guess repertoire, whatever. He would take care of whatever artist when they went town. And he got me to the Universal database for um, for my studio. So there was always like. Whoever, whatever, he's the, he's the reason that the reggaeton stuff came to me, like Daddy Yankee and all that stuff. And, and like, he's the reason like Sting's people would call when they're in town, you know. They would, we weren't criteria or anything, but at least right. they didn't inquire, you know. So um, he got us on the map, you know. So 
I appreciate that, and I love him for everything he did for the scene down here. Um, so you had all these different people working in the studio, right? That were working on different types of music <laughs> and and that sort of thing. So you said those were some of the good times. So at what point did it change to where maybe that wasn't the vibe? Just my partner, I mean, see eye to eye, I guess. I don't know what it was. I, I, I can tell you, you know, so it was just not a good thing, you know, at a certain point. So this is a litigious world, you know, and if you say the wrong thing about somebody, you can wind up in court easily. So even if it's true, you know, so. Sure. Um, I try to limit what I have to say. Oh, is this something negative about anybody? But I just want to make it clear that I have nothing to do with anything that's going on at Dungeon Recording Studios at this point. Um, so, yeah. And I know the name's back out there, so um, I'm not a litigious person, so I just want to make that clear that I'm not part of it. Did you sell any of your, the, the last part of what you owned and moved on? Is that pretty much what happened at that afterwards? No, the place where it closed it right before COVID. 9 11 ruined my label, and COVID ruined my studio. <laughs> well, not COVID, but close enough. <laughs> we'll call it COVID. So, after all that happened with the studio, and then, you know, obviously COVID happened, you know, where did that leave you at that point? Just like over it with a house full of gear. <laughs> I mean, house full of gear that needed to be sold, a bunch of cases. Daryl helped me out a lot with all that all that stuff, you know. So just time to move on, you know, like um realize you know, you can't there's no reason. I mean, like there's a certain point where you stop or you just move on, you know, like like any relationship, it's gotta end at some some point yeah would you say at this point in your life you're you're done for now or or are you still working on anything particular all i know is that today i'm not doing anything i could get a, i had some person that was talking to me about work her son like this and that and I, I just like you know i'm gonna put you in touch with mike he put together a studio he's great he's worked with rick rubin many times so Mike has Paper Mill Studios um, now up in uh, Tennessee, which if anybody's listening to this and I need to make a record, that's I would strongly suggest reaching out to him and because he's definitely got his shit together at this point. And it's been great to watch him, <clears throat> his production chops, you know, him acquire those chops, you know, like, I watch him get into guitar or keep like I just watch the man become a full blown producer at this point. You know, so I got nothing but good things to say about Paper Mill Studios in Tennessee. There you go. Are <laughs> people on. are people still reaching out to you to some degree uh to get advice or in that kind of mentor kind of role? Does that still happen uh in this time for you? A little bit when I was out, you know. If I go out and I'm places, but nobody actually picks up the phone or tech that I can think of right now. Yeah. Once in a while, somebody might send me something on you know, whatever to uh, listen to. But honestly, if you don't have publishing, I don't want to hear it. You know, it's like I don't want to be accused of stealing something down the road just because I heard it. Right. Or if I do do anything, you know, so there's just all these things. Like, and like, I definitely will give advice when asked, but like, I'm not gonna tell, I'll ask you if you have publishing, but if you don't have it, you don't know what it is. I'm yeah. not gonna explain it to you. No, that makes complete sense. Thanks for, for uh, shedding some light on that, Tommy. And uh, one of the stories that you brought up way earlier, we didn't really get a chance to unpack uh, you you brought up a House of Pain. Was that the the hip hop band House of Pain? Yeah, yeah, House of Pain. That was a we did a a run. It was actually three shows through the state, and it was um, St. Patrick's Day weekend. So, I, like, I like to do things like that. Like, you know, just kind of theme whatever you know. So, 
Oh, so we ran those guys through the state for three um, three shows, and there's this thing about a band that's going to be on tour that um, has a draw that just kind of makes everybody want to play <laughs> with that band or whatever. So Harry was able to find a way to monetize that. <laughs> so so I, we had a couple of bands that wound up on House of Pain tour. And um, so I made sure my guys, my friend, Collapsing Lungs, they got to, they were on the show. Uh, and then Harry got to monetize a couple of and it was a band I had never heard of, Limp Biscuit, and another band um, that no, I mean nobody had heard of Limp Biscuit, honestly. And then there was another band, um, Big Sky, <laughs> whatever. No, no, those guys didn't even fit. They were just long haired dudes. They, like they didn't like. So, the I'm responsible for the production out here at Revel Well Edge, whatever. Like you know how many names that place has had, and. Um, so I'm not really paying attention to it, so but I'm hearing about Biscuit that they're a great band and this and that. So, so I had a friend of mine, uh, his name, well, we'll just call him Stony Why Not, okay? <laughs> so he's driving the band around and he's like um, mi missing their exits and stuff. And so it's just like a stoner weekend for everybody, you know. It's like. So it's the day of the show, and I had heard a couple of things about Limp Bizkit, and I'm, I'm like, okay, whatever. So my thing was like, I've always been an advocate for marijuana, and, and I like to partake, you know? So back in the day, I was smoking the best of the best, and um, I made it a point to like, get backstage with Lethal and have a blunt and sit there and smoke with him a little bit, and like, and like we're talking, and he just starts going off about Limp Bizkit. Like, I'm fucking leaving. I'm leaving this fucking band. I'm going to join Limp Bizkit. These guys are fucking signed. It's over. So I told Harry, like, I told Harry, like, what's going on? And like, and like, everybody's telling me how great Limp Bizkit is. And like, um, now this is Limp Bizkit pre-signed. <laughs> this isn't Limp Bizkit signed with Lethal or anything. Like Two different bands, in my opinion, completely. So, um, like Harry calls Andy Summers and he signs uh the biscuit to like a management contract that he sold the next day <laughs> to to Summers. And uh so I so, so now Summers is on looking at everything that's happening here and because Lethal's talking all this shit and sure sure as shit, this band fucking rocked the stage like never before. Like I mean like these guys had it, you know, it was just like the crowd was in it. They're a fucking jamming. And um, then, uh, so uh, this is later on during the night. There's more to this night, but uh, these guys are, you know, they're all loaded up in their shit. Uh, and they got this, like, I want to say Dodge or Chrysler, old, old grandma station wagon that they got all their gear and shit in. And, like, um, so, uh, what's his, uh, not less, but uh, Fred. <laughs> so Fred is like, uh, uh, hey, what's up? I'm like, hey, what's up, dude? You know, good show, blah, blah, blah. And he's like, who are you? And I'm like, yeah, it's my show. You're kind of like, you know, playing on my dime. Thanks for everything, you know. I'm um, your guys. I just want to let you know your life's about to change. Shit ain't going to be the same for you. Good luck. And you owe me, I want a t shirt. Where's it? Where, yeah, you know, give me a t shirt. <laughs> I want a fucking t-shirt. So they, they sold all their t-shirts and he just had like a little cassette or whatever they gave me. It's like, oh, I owe you a shirt, man. I'll give you one next time I see it, man. Thanks. So, but he didn't know he was getting signed. I did, but like, so. Next thing you know, you got whatever version of Limp Bizkit that was, I guess 2.0 or you know, <laughs> um, just doing their thing, but to me, it wasn't the same band that I saw. You know, it was definitely it wasn't working for me like it did when I saw them. Um, I went to um, like a stadium show that they did, not stadium, but uh, I guess airline uh, where the Heat plays. I think that was where they were at. Okay, the American Airlines Arena. Whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, the name has changed. 
formerly Miami Arena, but that got torn down. So uh it might have even have been uh, um it might even have been the old arena. I, I'm not sure like yeah what's your was, but that's the only time I saw him afterwards was that one show. I never I never got my t shirt by the way. <laughs> I did, there's there's more to that night though. I mean, like, that I'd like to touch on, but yeah. so shit got out of control. I mean, just like Limp Biscuit play fucking place is crazy. I mean, fucking sick. And now here comes House of Pain, boom, and like shit just went fucking crazy. Like what? Like crazy, crazy. Like like, like I never seen. They carried this one lady out the front door. Her orbital was crushed. Her eyes hanging out. It's just fucking sick. And I go out the back door, and there's the fucking Fort Lauderdale Police Task Force all rioted out. Fucking, they got all their billy clubs and fucking shields and helmets. They're ready to fucking go in there. And I'm like, dude, what's up? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, if you can't get this under control, we're fucking, yeah, it's on, bro. <laughs> so luckily, I was able to get uh, lethal and I can't remember it on the mics, get the music down, get everybody to calm down. and like got the police not to kill people that night. So I, I felt that was a good accomplishment on my part. Like um, I kept a bunch of fans from getting beaten into the ground by Fort Lauderdale Police Department. And I mean, they were deep. <laughs> they were deep and they were informed. They were ready. <laughs> was the place over capacity or was it just a crazy I mean, crowd or what? I mean, it may have been, it may not have been, you know, it's just one of those things where, I mean, capacity is always like a question mark, you know, because you don't know who let who in, you know, like, I I used to, nobody knew who I was, so there was a time where I would walk around the venue and take pictures of, like, security guards taking money or whatever, <laughs> like, and when it's time to settle, it would be like, hey, bro, <laughs> I got camera full of pictures of your guys taking money at whatever door, you know, it's like um, they wouldn't know it was me. Like when it was time to settle, they'd be like, they know who I was, you know. <laughs> I never really told that story about how I saved half of Fort Lauderdale. <laughs> so so you mentioned that you were kind of walking around. People didn't really know you until at some point. So how did you keep your profile so low? It's where people weren't really knowing like who you were, even though you had a big hand of what was going on. I guess, like, I don't know. It's like an art being a wallflower. I mean, it's people that knew me knew me, but like, um, I was a long haired person, you know, just didn't, I just fit into the crowd better than I did into like a, I, I can't, I couldn't really answer that question. I mean, I just, I've been able to de DL myself as much as possible in life. You know? Yeah. Well, that's, a good, but, that's a good thing to uh, have. <laughs> I never needed like the acc accolades or like, you know, whatever. I just, I'm, I'm fine just not being recognized. <laughs> <laughs> it's worked out to my favor a lot. <laughs> now you mentioned uh before you never got your shirt from that limp Bizkit show so maybe if somebody from the band is discovers this episode uh maybe you can get that t-shirt again because uh i don't know I, that i wear i don't know that i wear it now <laughs> <laughs> i probably would have worn it if i had got it i don't know that i yeah i would i would have worn it right off the bat you know, sure those guys but they deserve it they did the work man they deserve everything they got what had changed? Because you mentioned that later on after, you know, when they when they became a bigger, more national band uh, at that point, became a bigger name, that it wasn't the same for you. What do you think that was that changed? I think they tried to polish it. And it was, a, it was, it came across better raw. You know, it was just like, just one of those things that you felt, you know. And once they polished it, they, you know, had the, added a lot of, uh, I guess, I mean, they had a 50 J lethal on their son on, you know, so there's a lot of sampling that started going on. It was a, it was a rock band when I saw them. They rocked. <laughs> there was none of, no bullshit. It was just them and them in the crowd. Not that their stuff wasn't good for what it was, but it was commercial at that point. You know? Right. There's no difference. That first record is like, you got your whole life, you know? 
the next record's kind of like, what the fuck? <laughs> we gotta <laughs> we gotta make a good record, guys. <laughs> yeah. And they got all this outside influence and this and that, and it's not really yours anymore. Right. So so that's the first record is like for me, it's like it's the, the important record. Unless you got a label like mine that's gonna let you be you, you know. Um, good point. So everybody like they got that commercial record somewhere, you know. And then and then they're back to eclectic or they're back to whatever they're doing. But you know, there's that record that everybody's got that everybody's got their hands in, you know. So were there any other stories like that that just really stand out for you as just one of those moments that captures the imagination when you kind of look back and think about like in that kind of situation, anything else come to mind? Not really just that a lot of it's surreal, you know, to see your friends like become fucking huge rock stars and just be able to like jump on a plane and bum rush their fucking catering. is just like amazing. I just don't know. <laughs> like, I, I mean, like for me, it's all like a, like well, I can't. I don't even really talk about it or anything because it just seems like I'm being pretentious or trying to do something, you know. Um, like I might say I, I've been in the music business, but I won't go into anything. Yeah. You know? Um. So, yeah, it's it's just a weird, weird, surreal thing, you know. Yeah. What What did your family think about the career you had with the music side and what you did there? Did they ever share any thoughts? Or feelings about what you did there? I'm not sure, but I kind of did it for my family, you know, like so that they had something to grab onto when they're talking about, you know, cousin Tommy or you know, whatever, you know. How, whatever, however I felt in, in the family scheme, you know. So just I, not everything I did was like um, something the family wanted to talk about, you know. Not that I've been. A bad person in any way just like i like to smoke weed you know i like to you know have fun and i do so i mean like it's not really something you can you know hey tommy's a, the greatest pot smoker out there <laughs> so, so the music was kind of for them you know? it was like something for them to yeah so i'm pretty sure i mean when i graduated college my mom wrote this letter to me about how she always knew I would make something out of myself and blah blah blah. Like, uh, coming from her, it really didn't mean much. Um, it's just like, you know, I don't know that my family really. I mean, nieces and nephews, they loved it, you know, because they wanted to come hang out, see shows, meet people, whatever. But. I don't think the family ever really got what I was doing or how how it blew up around me, you know. And just because things go well doesn't mean you make out monetarily, you know. They go well for a lot of people around you, you know. Not always your bank account growing, you know. True. So I, I just want to touch on something with Sam real quick. So early on, like when I was um, starting to figure out like what bands were worthy of my time and, and not when I was doing live shows, um, Sam was instrumental in that because he worked at Uncle Sam's. So he always had stuff for me to listen to. And like, hey, check out this band, check out that band. And like, I'd be like, hey, this band's tour. And he could check the sound scan numbers for me and stuff. And, and he helped me like really have a sense of what was going on out there, that, an educated sense of, for business decisions that, that I don't think I would have had otherwise. You know? So I, I want to just give a, a shout out to Sam and then I remember all that. I really appreciate all that too. Uh, so, yeah. And it's great to see, it's sad to see what's going on with him right now because he's hurt and he can't really play, but it's just so awesome because he was one of those guys that was always like, you know, great attitude, always wanted to be playing, always looking for the next thing. And I, I'm glad that he found Daniel and everything worked out for him, you know, so. That's one of those success stories that are surreal, you know? Right. So, yeah, man, there's a couple of stories like that. <laughs> so, I mean, like, it's great to, it's great to, you know, just have love for people that are, you know, 
السر... I see a lot of the opposite. I see a lot of vindictiveness and hate and whatever on people once they make it. But nah, bro, I can't. It's all about love and just letting people know you appreciate them. Yeah. I would agree. And I'm glad you had the chance to share that story as well. And just the fact that you have taken the time out uh, to come on the podcast and share your story. Because again, to your point, you have not really done anything like this before. First time really uh, sharing some of the things you've done over the course of your life and all the different parts that you had a, a hand in and the amount of people I imagine we haven't even talked about that you had a hand in influencing or being a part of their career or their journey. So it's just been great getting a chance to have you on to tell your story. So I thank you for that, Tommy. There's people like all kinds of people, because you got people that are production people, people that are um, engineers, people that are musicians, people that are promoters. They've all played their part along the way, you know? And, um, it's just, it, like I said, it's surreal. It's like, really? <laughs> like, you really? Oh, really? Okay. And there's a lot of sad stories there too, you know? So not everybody that deserved to make it, make it, not everybody who deserved to make it, made it, you know? Um, some people just, you know, they didn't have it in them. So people just weren't meant to be on this planet with us. You know, so. And those are all sad, sad stories, man. So, yeah. But there was always talent. There was yeah. always talent, bro. So now, a lot of what I do now is like, I, I still like have, I still like mentor people and help people, but in a different way, you know. Um, like that because a lot of a lot of the tragedy out there kind of made me do research and, and, and learn things for myself and it's just so there's there's a lot of people in the world that don't have emotional integrity um and they don't love themselves so i've spent a lot of time just learning how to love myself and to be um, a person with emotional integrity so that I could share that with people and, and help them along their journey with that at this point. Because there's just such a thing out there in the world with mental health and I just lost people that I really care about and I just think it's an important tool to have in your life is to be that person and be able to share it and help people however you can. I don't know how that came across, but it was meant to come across as like people need love, bro. Yeah. <laughs> no, absolutely. Not punk, yeah. Not just punk rock. Right. It's a, it's an easy thing to see now, honestly. It's like like you just for me, it's just I just see how people treat themselves. And, and I know if they've been taught how to love themselves or not, you know. Right. I, I try to encourage that more at this point. Um than like writing good songs. It's like, you know, do you love yourself, man? How's everything going? <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's, I, I, I care more about people's health and their mental health than I do about anything else that's going on in their lives at this point. Their families, you know, like, sure. There was a point where I just cared if you had another song for me to listen to, you know, <laughs> but, but that's changed drastically. Yeah. Yeah. And that sounds like something that is, uh, you know, very important and, you know, more important than just what the music is, of course, uh, people's well-being and mental health and everything. So it's great to hear uh, that that side too, Tommy. And like I said, it's just been great getting a chance to to hear from you and to to hear more about what's what you've been doing, both past and also uh, present to. Uh, was there anything else, perhaps, that you didn't get a chance to to shed any light on that you wanted to before we start to wrap things up? Yeah, I just wanted to say that South Florida is a unique place. Um, there's just so many people from all over the world here. And um, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere um, as an artist. Um, I just want to put that out there. And uh, 
I really appreciate what you're doing with the sound archives. So I guess um, this will live on past me. <laughs> so so I, I, people will know that I existed, which is good, right? That's good, right? <laughs> so uh, other than the people that know I, I existed. So and I, I can't wait to help you promote. I haven't promoted anything in quite some time. So I can't wait to help you promote this. And in the future, I want to help you promote also. What you're doing honestly is righteous and I appreciate you. It's good to get to know you a little bit over this time. And I'm sorry I don't have a bunch of pictures for you, but <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate well, it though. Too. And you know what's interesting though is that you know one of the things that comes up a lot with guests is that uh because of the time period, not everybody had that archive of pictures because you didn't have your cell phone. You can pretty much capture whatever you wanted in the moment. Not everybody did that. So, uh, but what you have shared though is appreciated. So I do thank you for that. Oh, no problem, man. You're, you're a righteous dude, bro. I appreciate it, Tommy. Again, great having you on the podcast. Great getting a chance to chat with you today. Uh, were there any kind of final comments you wanted to share or anything else you wanted to kind of close with uh, before we wrap it up? Just that, I mean, if you, it's a passion, you know, it's a, it's a love and it's not, and I, Chris asked me one time, you know, what do I think that made it, what, what did I think that made the time that everybody came up so special? And for me, it was um, just that for me, I wasn't in it for the money. It was the music. And like, if you do your job and you do it well, um, and the breaks come your way, then the money will come. But but to make it about anything other than the music is a mistake. Um, so that's all. I appreciate everything and everyone. <laughs>